You're listening to Lost in History with Scott Miller. In November 1934, Franklin Delano Roosevelt received an astonishing package from an admirer. It included an aging photo of a home in the Portuguese colony of Macau. On the back, in barely legible ink, was written Arrowdale, the former residence of Warren Delano. The future president was ecstatic. Delano was his grandfather, a figure he had grown close to as a child. Though Roosevelt by surname, he always felt closer to the Delano side of his family and learning about them had become a passion. There was, however, more to the old keepsake than FDR likely understood. The story behind that photograph is the story of tensions that exist to this day between the United States and China. I'm Scott Miller, and welcome to Lost in History, the podcast devoted to the stories of people who have had a great impact on the United States, but who have also been lost to the mists of time. As with others in this series, I learned of Delano's story while researching my first book, The President and the Assassin, McKinley, Terror, and Empire at the Dawn of the American Century. China, the scene of this story, drove much of America's foreign policy during the McKinley presidency and it was men like Warren Delano who first forged a link between the two nations. In 1825, 16-year-old Warren Delano joined his father on a boat trip up the Hudson River to witness the ceremonies that inaugurated the Erie Canal. It was the scenery, not the celebration though, that most impressed young Delano. Along the banks of the river, he could see mansions belonging to the nation's truly wealthy. One day, Warren vowed to himself, he would live in such splendor and set a specific figure by which to measure his success. What he called his competence, he needed to make $100,000, nearly $3 million in today's money. In 1830s America, there was no better place to achieve that objective than in China. For the better part of two decades, legendary businessmen such as John Jacob Astor, Thomas Perkins, and Abiel Abbott Lowe had made vast fortunes trading for Chinese tea. All that was needed, it seemed, was a taste for adventure and a knowledge of ships. Delano was made for the job. His ancestors had been part of the Pilgrim Expedition and had built their livelihoods from seafaring ever since. His uncle Amasa Delano had circumnavigated the globe three times and helped pioneer the China trade. Amasa would write that China was first for greatness, riches, and grandeur of any country ever known. Warren's father, too, had been a ship's captain. In 1833, Warren set out to follow in their paths. That autumn, after three months at sea, his ship, aptly named the Commerce, entered the mouth of the Pearl River and made its way upstream toward what was then called Canton, present-day Guangzhou. There he saw a collection of buildings that looked oddly out of place. Lined up along the beach were two and three-story whitewashed structures made in a Roman style, topped with triangular roof lines held up by stout columns. The flags of a dozen countries fluttered over tidy gardens fronting each. Situated under the stars and stripes were the offices of half a dozen American trading firms, including Russell Sturgis & Co., Delano's new employer, There he was shown to his sleeping quarters on the second floor above a warehouse filled with tea, the stench so overpowering it was almost impossible to breathe. The community that Delano settled into was organized by the Chinese imperial household for the explicit purpose of keeping foreigners isolated. Spanning a scant 12 acres and surrounded by a wooden fence, it would be as far as most foreign traders were allowed to travel into China. To the Chinese, these American, British, French, and Dutch businessmen were foreign devils, unrefined, ignorant, and driven solely by their own greed. Outside the compound, peasants gathered by the hundreds to laugh and spit in the direction of the merchants. The atmosphere at first took a toll on Delano. He told friends that Canton was a vile hole. The hot and sticky climate left him miserable. Several times a day, he took a bath and donned a fresh white linen suit. 
Delano complained to his father that he might not be able to make it long in China. At least he had not invested a great deal of time or money in a venture that looked doubtful, he wrote. What exactly Delano knew of how traders were making their money when he arrived in China was unclear. American and British merchants had once traded otter and seal pelts obtained on the west coast of the United States for tea. Britain had discovered another product the Chinese hungered for, opium, a drug which was an abundant supply in its colony in India. Brought to China, the narcotics swept the country addicting millions who are willing to do almost anything for their next fix. Americans, at first unable to obtain opium in India, developed their own sources in Turkey. When the Chinese emperor saw what opium was doing to his people, he banned it. But an entire industry had developed based on the drug. Distribution, banking, and retail through opium dens that was impossible to smash. A quick bribe was usually enough to silence any government official who tried to stop it. There was no doubt that the foreigners selling opium knew the deleterious effects of their products. Delano, though, was able to overcome a guilty conscience. He claimed that it really wasn't that much different from selling wine or spirits in the United States. I do not pretend to justify the prosecution of the opium trade in a moral or philanthropic point of view, Warren wrote home. But as a merchant, I insist it has been a fair, honorable, and legitimate trade. Others, however, refused to let Delano and the merchant community off quite so easily. One American trader, the puritanical David Oliphant, never tired of telling others around the foreign compound how bad they were for trading the drug. To help Chinese kick their addictions and to call attention to their suppliers, Oliphant even began to recruit missionaries from the U.S. to come to Canton. The first to arrive was a Protestant churchman named Elijah Bridgman, who was also disgusted by the opium business. But it presented him with a tricky dilemma. He depended on traders for transport on the river and even funding. And at a practical level, his daily life would be miserable if he criticized fellow Americans and Brits too aggressively. Bridgman wrote home that it was the most delicate subject to touch upon. At sparsely attended Sunday services, the missionary spoke about Chinese addicts, but chose his words carefully and made a point never to mention the names of any merchants. Though Delano found China hard at first, soon familiar patterns emerged that seemed to make his new home more comfortable. An 18-hour day kept him too busy to think of home, what with keeping the books, tasting tea, and packing leaves. His hands became stained a shade of green that would not wash off. Delano also struck up what was to become the most important business relationship of his life with his Chinese trading partner, Hokwa. With a wispy beard, flowing silk robes, and a bird-like physique, Hokwa developed a real fondness for the Americans, who in turn grew to greatly admire him. And Delano's mood definitely improved when he saw how much money he was making. British and American traders were perfecting new means of smuggling opium into China. Before heading up the Pearl River to Canton, the newly developed and speedy clipper ships offloaded their cargo at the small island of Lin Ten, where hundreds of what were called fast crab boats that were powered by as many as 20 rowers sped the cargoes to shore. On any given day, there might be as many as two dozen ships anchored off the cone-shaped island. The volume of the narcotic reaching China soared. According to Hunt's Merchants Magazine in New York, Trade in opium was greater than any other product in the world, except for cotton. In the autumn of 1837, the missionary Bridgman wrote home that a crisis was quickly approaching over the drug trade. In fact, a little less than a year later, the Chinese emperor dispatched one of the most promising stars of his government to act as a sort of drug czar, Lin Zhu. The son of a teacher who was well known for his honesty and supreme intellect Lin was determined to once and for all smash the opium business. Delano, in fact, had a lot to lose. Business had been booming. He joined friend Robert Bennett Forbes at Russell & Co., the most famous and prestigious of the American trading houses in Canton, and profits from opium trading had started to soar. Things were going so well that Warren wrote his younger brother Ned that plenty of money was waiting to be made in China and urged him to come to Asia. Pudgy and impressionable, 
Ned looked up to his brother, but he'd recently read of a horrible fire that sank a passenger ship off the east coast of the United States and was reluctant to undertake a long voyage. He was also highly susceptible to seasickness. Yet Warren made his case so well that Ned overcame his fears and sailed for Canton. Ned was stunned to see what China had done to his brother. I should not have known him under circumstances different from which I was now placed. He appeared to me worn out. A yellow, cadaverous visage added to a slow gait, and a body a little inclined forward. Yet at the same time, Ned was struck by how worldly Warren had become. He could now skillfully carve a duck at the dinner table, and he was an expert conversationalist, able to spin an interesting story laced with sarcastic bite. Above all, just as Warren had promised, money was pouring in. Looking over the books for 1839 and 1840, Ned could not help feeling giddy over what he called a magnificent profit, the likes of which I think I cannot again accrue. Lin arrived in Canton in March 1839 and wasted no time laying down the law. Only a few days later, he sent Delano's Chinese business partner, Hokwa, to the foreign compound to inform British and Americans that they must turn over their opium. When Delano and others resisted, Lin ordered troops to surround their living area. Boats were lined up three deep on the riverbank. Nothing he ordered was to move in or out. Outside the gates, an unruly mob blared horns and banged gongs. Members of the trading houses, Delano included, settled in for a siege. They quickly found ways to get food smuggled in and water was secretly drawn from the river. With no servants, a duty roster was drawn up with chores that would have once been unthinkable. At Russell's headquarters, Delano was given the job of cook. When it was discovered, as one friend put it, that he couldn't even boil an egg, Warren was handed a broom and put in charge of cleaning. By early May, British and American merchants had gotten sick of the stalemate and finally announced that they would hand over their opium stores some 21,000 chests weighing 3 million pounds. It would take the Chinese over three weeks to finally get rid of all the drugs they'd confiscated. Bridgman was delighted. Opium had received its death blow, he wrote. The British, though, had far from given up. When word reached London that merchants had been forced to hand over their opium, Foreign Minister Lord Palmerston ordered the Royal Navy to teach the Chinese a lesson. The British Navy soon began to bombard Chinese forts, and British Marines moved inland to engage Chinese troops in a series of bloody battles. It was from the start to be a one-sided conflict, with the technologically superior British smashing the Chinese. In Canton, the two Delano brothers watched the war with conflicted feelings. They had little love for the Chinese, but they had to admit the war was good for their pocketbooks. With the British no longer able to trade with China, American business flourished. As one annoyed Brit put it, while we hold the horns, they milk the cow. Delano delivered a particularly painful blow when he purchased a British merchant vessel and quickly turned around and sold it to the Chinese at a tidy profit. By the spring and early summer of 1842, it was becoming clear the Chinese could not continue fighting the British much longer. The Royal Navy blockaded numerous Chinese ports and delivered a crippling blow to Chinese government finances when it captured tax barges on the Yangtze River. On August 29th, Chinese diplomats signed the Treaty of Nanking aboard the HMS Cornwallis, agreeing to a breathtaking collection of concessions. China granted Britain access to five new ports and most spectacularly, the entire island of Hong Kong. The China trade would never be the same again. Delano still hadn't made as much money as he wanted, but by that same summer, he decided it was high time for some home leave, and perhaps most importantly, to find an American wife. It was while visiting his father in Massachusetts that winter that he found a suitable candidate, a shy, beautiful, good-humored young woman, 18-year-old Catherine Robbins Lehman, Catherine's parents instantly approved of a possible union. We have from the first been delighted by him, Mrs. Lehman wrote of Delano. 
He has such a composed and dignified air for a man of business, such a quiet and sensible mode of expressing his rational opinions, that there can be nothing but pleasure in his society. The couple was married at Northampton in central Massachusetts on November 1st, and only a month later departed for China. Catherine Delano dreaded the dangers of the trip and separation from her parents. But to her surprise, she found she liked her new home in Macau, where the wives of traders typically settled. Its bustling harbor and its quaint hillside peppered with white houses was exciting yet comfortable. The couple dubbed their home Arrowdale for their shared interest in archery. I'm the happiest person living, she wrote. Delano, too, was in a good mood. In 1844, President John Tyler sent a diplomatic team led by Massachusetts lawyer and congressman Caleb Cushing in search of a trade deal similar to what the British had won in the Opium War. Cushing was determined to impress the Chinese. He sailed from the United States with a fleet of four vessels and a collection of artifacts of American achievement, including a model of a steam excavator, a six-shooter revolver, a telescope, and a plan for a railroad. But Cushing arrived in China only to learn it had all hardly been necessary. After some initial jockeying, the Chinese in July agreed to virtually all American demands. Like the British, the Americans gained access to five new ports. China would be prevented from arresting or trying Americans for any crime. Missionaries would be permitted to build churches and schools. Most importantly for Delano was that the deal, through carefully chosen words, effectively reopened the opium trade to Americans. Cushing, the merchants, and the missionaries could hardly believe what they'd accomplished. As Cushing put it, the inexperienced Chinese were versed neither in economics nor in Western law and did not appreciate what they gave away. Though Catherine initially enjoyed Macau, her mood plunged when her first child died. It quickly became clear to her husband that she would not fully recover her emotional strength as long as they remained in Asia. So in 1846, the couple packed up and left, believing they had seen the last of China. The huge nest egg that Delano had squirreled away should have lasted the couple for years to come, and they looked forward to settling down. But the combination of poor investments and a disastrous collapse in the economy sent the couple and their now seven children back to Asia. Setting up a home in Hong Kong, Delano quickly made a second fortune as the opium business expanded and in 1869 the family returned to the United States for good. Back in New York State, the family settled into the mansion that Delano had so long dreamed of, a 62-acre spread on the Hudson. Just upriver lived James Roosevelt, who in 1880 wed his daughter Sarah, Two years later, she would give birth to the future president, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. As a child, the future president spent endless hours picking over the many souvenirs and decorations the family brought back from China and listening to his grandfather's stories. So much so, in fact, that he came to consider himself an expert on the country. During his years in the White House, aides would whisper to each other not to mention China, lest the president launch into a long-winded story. Roosevelt once admonished Secretary of the Treasury, Henry Morgenthau Jr., over a fine point of Asian finance, saying, please remember that I have a background of little over a century in Chinese affairs. What exactly FDR learned of his grandfather's role in the dirty business of opium trading is unclear. He refused to discuss it, despite political opponents who brought up the family connection to the opium trade from time to time. But the Chinese would not forget. The first opium war that Delano witnessed was followed by another in a series of the famed unequal treaties that opened up almost all of defenseless China to foreign businesses. By the 1920s, in fact, the U.S. Navy maintained its own fleet of riverboats that patrolled deep into China to protect American business interests. It's a memory that has burned into China's collective consciousness. When President Trump's trade team presented Chinese officials with a list of ambitious economic demands, one of China's state-controlled news outlets asked, is it now 1840? 
I hope you enjoyed this week's show. If you have any questions or feedback, please reach out to me on Twitter at Lost, the letter N, History Pod. And be sure to check out my website, www.scottmillerauthor.com. We'll see you next time.